Hi guys, uh, this is Don Gichai. Today I'll be taking you through uh, Form 1, second topic, that is computer systems. And therefore, uh, we shall start by looking at the course outline, what we are expected to uh, actually go through at the end of uh, the session. And therefore, uh, our course outline is we shall look at the introduction, then we shall look at uh, computer system, then computer hardware, input devices, central processing unit or the CPU. Uh, we shall look at the secondary uh, storage devices and media, uh, also power and interface connectors, uh, also basic computer setup and cabling, then computer software and raster. Uh, we shall look at the criteria for selecting computers. Therefore, our first part, we shall ask ourselves what is a computer system. And therefore, a computer system is a collection of parts that work together to achieve the aim of data processing, storage, and transmission when need be. Then uh, there are parts for a computer system to exist. There are parts or components that make up a computer system. Therefore, we shall go ahead and look at that. The following are the components of a computer system. Number one, we have computer user who is also known as the RiveWare. Therefore, don't confuse, we have RiveWare, students like uh, write RiveWire, it should be uh, RiveWare. Therefore, for us to have a computer system, we have a uh, computer user as one of the components. Now, the second component is the software or programs or applications. Uh, nowadays, we call it apps. Therefore, if somebody talk of apps, then he or she is talking of applications. Then the third one, we have the hardware. And basically, a computer system is a collection of parts that work together to achieve the aim of data processing, storage, and transmission. And therefore, it is supported by three components. We have the rightware, the software, and the hardware. Then we go ahead. We go ahead and uh, look at the various definitions of the three. When we talk about the hardware, the hardware refers to the physical parts of a computer, which is divided into four. We have storage devices. We have the central processing unit or the CPU. We have input devices and we have output devices. Then when you talk about the software, Software refers to the programs or instructions that guide the computer on what to do and when. It is also okay to call it applications or apps. You can just say apps or that is when you're referring to gadgets like tablets or mobile phone. Then we have the liveware. Liveware is the computer user. Uh, who operates the computer hardware and the software. And therefore, minus the rightware, the computer system uh, does not exist. Then we can now go one-on-one -on -one and look at the three components of computer system uh, in depth. Therefore, we shall start with the hardware, look at the hardware from start to the end. Then we shall go to the software uh, since we have uh, finished with the liveware. Liveware is simply the user and uh, we finish it at that. Therefore, let's look at the computer hardware. The computer hardware, we have said these are the physical parts of a computer classified into four. And therefore, computer hardware is classified into four main groups. Let's look at them. These are the four main groups. We have input devices, and then you have output devices. You also have storage devices. And lastly, we have the central processing unit. Now we shall go ahead and uh, look in depth 
input devices in depth, output devices in depth, so, uh, storage devices in depth, the central processing unit in depth, so that everything is uh, to the uh, finest. Then uh, we, we go ahead. Now let's look at the input devices in depth. First of all, we have to define what are input devices. Now, input devices are devices that convert user input, which is in human readable form, to machine readable form that a computer can process and understand. Therefore, input devices are devices that give the computer uh, input or what to process. We classify them depending on the technique or method they use to enter data. Therefore, don't forget, we classify input devices depending on the method or technique they use to enter uh, data with. Therefore, uh, we classify input devices as follows. We have pointing devices. We then have keying devices. We then have scanning devices. We have digital cameras. We also have speech or voice recognition devices. And then we have the smart input uh, devices. Therefore, we shall go ahead now and uh, look at each part, each classification in depth. Let's look at keying devices. Now, when you talk about keying devices, these are devices with the buttons that can be pressed, or rather, these are gadgets that are used to type. And therefore, they convert typed numbers and letters and special characters into machine readable formats. Therefore, when you press A, when you press 0, when you press question mark, uh, those are all other number, letter, or special characters and they are converted from what you can see, that is a question mark, to what the computer can understand. Then we have uh, types of keying devices. Let's look at the types of keying devices. We have traditional keyboard. That is a normal keyboard that you have at your computer app. Then we have a flexible keyboard. This is a keyboard that can be folded and packed in a bag for easy transport. Later on, in the next slide, you will see the photos of these ones. Then we have ergonomic keyboard. This is a keyboard that is elevated. It is raised. It is specially made to allow the user work for long hours without straining. Therefore, it is a comfortable keyboard. Then we have the keypad. Uh, if you look at your smartphone or your tablet, it has a key, a keyboard. Therefore, a keyboard, in short, in layman language, a keyboard that belongs to a tablet or a mobile phone is a keypad. Then we have the touchscreen keypad. That is the keypad that is virtual. It comes on your screen, but you cannot actually uh, remove it. You can only use it. Then um, for the bright people, they use special keyboards called Blythe keyboard. They are used for the uh, bride people. Then see the images uh, we have discussed uh, in the next slide. Let's look at the images. Therefore, these are the, uh, the images. The first images are the flexible keyboard. You can see how flexible keyboard looks like. We have said it can be folded and then packed in a bag. Then the next uh, image is the Blair keyboard. Look at the keyboard. A normal person may not actually know what is happening. These are the keyboard used by the bright people. And lastly, we have the comfortable keyboard. Look at the keyboard. It doesn't look the, the one that you are used to. This is an, a comfortable keyboard called a normic keyboard. Then we can proceed uh, to our next category, pointing devices. Pointing. Pointing means you are actually directing it somewhere. You are pointing, just like the word says. Therefore, pointing devices, these are the input devices that 
enter data or instructions by controlling a pointer on the screen. Yeah, I'm sure you are aware of this since in the other topic you learned about clicking, right clicking and controlling the mouse. Therefore, uh, pointing devices, they control a pointer on the screen. Examples of pointing devices are you have mouse, trackball, joystick, and right pen. We'll all see this in the next slide. Then uh, we have, we can look at the mouse. Now a mouse is a pointing device that rolls on a small board and is used to control the movement of the cursor on the computer screen. Therefore, you shall also see the mouse, though I am sure you are conversant with the mouse. Let's look at the types of the mouse. We have traditional mouse. Now, traditional mouse is the old uh, model of mouse that um, is actually almost out of the market. Then we have the optical mouse. This is the mouse that writes. If you look at it uh, below the, that is uh, under, under the mouse, you will get that there is a tiny camera that reads the texture of the service. If the service is very smooth, the cursor doesn't move smoothly. If the service is rough uh, or texture is rough, then it moves smoothly. Therefore, that is a tiny camera that reads the texture. Then we have cordless mouse. These are the mouse used in laptops, though it can still be used in a desktop. Cordless means it doesn't have a cable. And therefore, it has a transceiver and a, trans a transmitter. It uses some batteries and then coordinates the movement. The mouse is mostly used with the graphical user interface or GUIs. When you talk about a GUI interface or a graphical user interface, it means that uh, we have small pictures called icons, like the ones you see in your phone or the ones you see in your desktop. Therefore, when you move the mouse, it controls those small pictures. And therefore, it we term that as graphical user interface. Those small pictures you see in your phone or in your laptop or in your machine, we call them icons. Therefore, this is the cordless mouse. Look at how the mouse looks like. It has a small USB transceiver. And inside it, just like a you control the remote control on a TV, it transmit infrared uh, waves towards the machine. Then there is this other input device, though probably you might not have uh, uh, found it, but it was used or it is still used in some countries, is called trackball. Now trackball works just like the mouse, but instead of moving it on a flat surface, it has a ball fixed on its top, which is rolled using the index finger. Therefore, you will see how the track ball looks like. As the ball rotates, it moves a pointer on the screen. The user can then click its button to execute uh, the selected command. We shall see how it works. Now, the advantage of track ball over the mouse is that a track ball doesn't require a flat service for movement. Therefore, you can see that it's a great uh, advantage. Note, today some computers come with a trackball on top of a keyboard and a mouse. That is very important for you to note. And therefore, this is the trackball. Look at how the trackball looks like. It is so similar to a mouse, only that you don't move it in the flat service like we do in the mouse. You only rotate the ball. That is the ball that you can see located on the top. Then uh, we can proceed to touchpad. Hope, hopefully you know what is a touchpad. Uh, if you look at a laptop, if you have ever come across a laptop, a laptop doesn't uh, require a mouse. That is a well-functioning laptop. Uh, there is the part that uh, uh, behaves like the mouse or is used as the mouse. Therefore, a touchpad is a part of the laptop that allows the user to click, right-click, and scroll 
just like mouse does. Therefore, this is a laptop touchpad. You can see how it looks like. We also have the other uh, side. Therefore, these are the touchpad. You can see how the touchpad uh, looks like. Then, uh, you have ever visited the cyber cafe and uh, gaming stations where you go to play your PS and other games. And I'm also sure some of you even in the house, you have the game paddles. No, there is this input device looks like a gear. Therefore, joystick and game paddles, these are hardhead input devices which enable the user to interact with the program. They are used for playing computer games. Therefore, we shall see how this one looks like. A joystick is an input device that looks like a car gear lever. It looks like a gear. It is an analog to digital converter where the input involves moving the control lever sideways, upwards, or downwards to control the movement of the cursor on the screen. Just like the mouse, it has button which is used for selecting an item. It is commonly used in playing video games. On the other hand, let's look at the game paddles. A game paddle may consist of a button which can be pressed by the user to input data to the program. When the program senses that the button has been pressed, it takes the appropriate action such as firing a missile or reversing the direction of the tank. A game paddle can also consist of a dial which when rotated it conveys information to the program. The program must immediately act on the information supplied by the dial setting e.g. a goalkeeper may be moved across the face of the goal to intercept a shot. Therefore, let's see the images in the next slide. Let's see uh, the images, joystick and game paddle. This is a joystick. Just look at how a joystick looks like. It looks like a car gear with some buttons. Then we have the game paddle. Uh, you are used to this one for playing the PS. Then uh, the next input device is a digitizer. The Digitizers are input devices that convert graphical drawings or images on the paper or other material uh, into digital data and convey them to the computer memory. The digitizers are just look like a tablet. You see how they look like. Digitizers are slow but easy to handle and errors are hardly present. Then we have sisters to digitize us. We call them tablets or graphical pads. Therefore, they are used to entering drawings directly into the computer. Therefore, as you draw, uh, whatever you are drawing goes directly uh, to the computer. You use a pen-like gadget called stylus to draw. Then as you draw, then uh, whatever you draw is transmitted in the uh, laptop or in your PC. Therefore, you can see how the graphical tablets or digitizers look like. It looks like a tablet with a pen. Therefore, what you, what you draw there is actually transmitted to the computer screen. Then, let's look at the uses of graphical tablets. Therefore, they are used in engineering and architecture design. They are used in computer-aided uh, design to draw diagrams and maps. They are used in banks and insurance companies to verify signatures. Therefore, those are the three main uses of tablets. If you go to a bank and you want to verify your signature, you are given uh, those tablets. Then you draw your signature there. Then they can verify they are also used for detecting forgeries, especially that is for the uh, signatures. Let's uh, look to the next one, digital camera. Uh, you are very conversant with the digital camera. 
your phones, your smartphones uh, has these things. Therefore, a digital camera stores its images in digital form. These images can be streamed or entered directly into a computer for editing or printing by connecting the camera to a computer using a special cable. Therefore, you are all aware of that. There are two types of digital cameras, one that take still, that is motionless images, that is photographs, and another that takes picture in motion video. And also, they can take both. Therefore, these are examples of uh, digital cameras that you have ever seen. The first one is very common. Also, we have Sony and others, Kodak and others. Then we can look at speech or voice inputs. Voice recognition is a type of input method where a microphone connected to a computer system is used to enter data in form of spoken words into the computer. The speech recognition devices or SRD accept spoken command and convert them into electronic passes or signals which can be processed by the computer. Then you can look at the uses of voice input devices. Voice input is a fast and easier method, mostly suitable for handicapped people. Therefore, that is very important. This is a very good method to capture uh, data from handicapped people. It is also very secure. Uh, you have seen a service provider like Safaricom. Uh, there is uh, at Safaricom, my voice is my password. You know, nobody can actually imitate your voice. Your voice is special. Therefore, it is a very secure way uh, of making sure that you are dealing with the fraudsters. Therefore, it's also used for electronic money transfer. House car security using voice activated locks. You can open your gate by your voice and nobody else can do that. Office security rooms for access. Uh, yeah, in, in voice activated toys and uh, uh, that is voice activated toys at the games. In quality control and automation. Yeah, those are some of the uses of uh, voice input. Then we have speech recognition now gadgets. You can see the mic. Yeah, that one is actually used by people recording music. It has the filter there. Then the mic is behind the filter. Then we have headphones. Like personally, as I'm recording, I'm using the second gadget. That is the headphone with the mic. Therefore, it is recognizing my speech and actually recording it. Then there are two main types of scanners. Therefore, let's look at the scanning devices. We have two types of scanners. You can scan a full page is by help of a scanner called flatbed scanner. On the other hand, you can use a hard scanner. Uh, just a scanner held by your hand, then you pass over the document, just like you do using your mobile phone. And therefore, your mobile phone usually has a hard head scanner in it, but a page scanner is actually like a photocopier where you place your book or your magazine or your newspaper, then it is actually uh, captured. Then we have document readers. A document reader is an input device which can read data directly from the source, such as bank check, and con convey it to the computer in the form of electronic or uh, signals. Types of codes on documents that can be recognized by a document reader. Let's look at them. We have marks. Therefore, codes, some of the codes that the document readers can recognize are marks. Uh, also, when marking an exam like KCPE, we use document readers, which are types of scanners. They identify marks from pencil. They can identify characters, e.g. meter readings, printed lines like barcodes. They can read barcodes. Document readers can be classified as 
uh, optical readers and magnetic uh, readers. Therefore, let's look at these ones. We have the optical readers and uh, magnetic uh, readers. Now, optical readers, optical readers use the principles of right. Optical actually means right. And therefore, uh, when you get the term optical, we are talking of right. Uh, right is involved. And therefore, optical readers use the principles of right to sense the document content or to capture data. A special type of concentrated beam of right is passed over the object, image or text which needs to be entered into the computer. The reader converts the data into digital form and then passes it to the computer for processing. Therefore, that's how the optical readers work. Then we have the image scanners. Uh, the image scanners. A scanner is used to input pictures or photographs into the computer. This is because a keyboard or mouse cannot perform these tasks. Therefore, if uh, a single station whereby you want to capture an image directly into the computer, like I have done, if you look at these images that I'm using, they have been scanned from somewhere and then placed in the in the document. A mouse and a keyboard cannot do that. That's why we need an image scanner. Therefore, that is uh, our subtitle there. It should have come here, yeah? scanning devices. Therefore, when we talk about a, an image scanner, we shall see how actually uh, it looks like. There are two types of uh, optical uh, readers. When you talk about now the optical, we have optical character reader and optical mark reader. Let's look at that. Now, optical character reader. Let's start with optical character reader. Optical character recognition or, or optical character reader. Uh, you can either call it optical character leader or optical character recognition or Haroki is a data capture technique which enables the computer to read printed or hard written documents directly. The characters are formed onto the document by a typewriter or computer printer using a special type of font. Hard writing can also be recognized if the characters have been carefully or well formed. Therefore, that is how we are actually calling it character reader. It reads the characters either written by your hand using like a special pencil, either used uh, uh, written by a special ink or font by a typewriter or by a computer. Then now we have the sister to that optical mark reader or optical mark recognition. So book, books, we call it recognition. The, this one is the one that is used to mark KCP. The documents are pre-printed with predefined data positions. These positions can be marked by, let's say, a pencil. Then the o, OMR or optical mark reader detects the presence or absence of a mark on a form by sensing the reflected light of these positional marks. The reader is then used to convert the mark into computer readable data and set the value of the sensed data into the computer in form of electronic signals. Therefore, that's how uh, KCP actually is marked. Therefore, if you miss the, 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 the correct value, then it is counted as zero. The accuracy of optical mark reader depends on the mark being made uh, properly. Then we can look at the magnetic uh, magnetic scanners. Now, magnetic scanners, uh, the most used one is called MIC or magnetic ink character reader. Magnetic ink character reader is a machine recognition of character that recognize characters printed with magnetic ink. Now, when you look at the checks that we take to banks, 
uh, down there if you have ever looked at a check there are some special character written using special ink uh, read by this machine the document characters are typed or printed in ink containing iron 2 oxide that gives them a magnetic property after forming the characters onto the document the ink characters are magnetized by passing the document under a strong magnetic field during the reading process the magnetized characters cause current to flow through the read head depending on the magnetized surface area occupied by individual characters therefore the reader differentiates characters depending on the magnetic pattern that being uh, that bring different amount of currents therefore then these are conveyed to the computer and then interpreted therefore this is a gadget that is actually is uh, that is used to read ink that is magnetic ink characters written on uh, documents like checks and it is very useful in the banks then we have this very important uh, gadget you have ever seen it that the look at the image below the slide we have a barcode 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 are actually lines of different thickness that are interpreted differently in according to the prices of different commodities and therefore you have the barcode reader you have ever visited a supermarket and then you see how the 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 gadget uh, the the gadget that the cashier sp pr uh, that is uh, wave the item be before it or actually in front of it then it leads by beeping therefore we call them barcode leader or wand w a n d wand therefore a barcode leader this is a device used to read the barcodes printed on many items in the supermarket and pharmacies each item is given a code uh, known as barcode a barcode is a set of parallel bars of varying thickness and spaces of varying widths uh, representing number code you can look at the, uh, the diagram below here therefore that is what actually a barcode is then we have Kimball or uh, punched tags now some manufacturers use keyboard tags or small paper punched cards attached to clothes or other commodities on sale mostly in the supermarket you have ever seen those ones therefore an optical scanning method is used to read the keyboard tag and extract the product code at the price from it therefore it is very similar to uh, a barcode only that it is actually different in rook then we have touch touch sensitive screens a touch sensitive screen uses the human finger as an input media you all know this you have ever seen a smartphone you have used a smartphone and uh, then you see how uh, that one works that is the touch sensitive screen also in televisions like Citizen TV, uh, KTN and others, you will see the commentators using uh, the touch sensitive screens. Therefore, you can also look at the touch sensitive screens here. I'm sure you are very aware and conversant uh, with that. Then we have the right pen and stylus, though we had uh, looked at this when we were talking of digitizers. Therefore, we have a right pen. A red pen looks just like a pen, a normal pen. A red pen is a hard head device with a similar in shape to a ball pen and has right sensitive point. It consists of a pen like device uh, called stylus connected by a cable to a computer terminal. Now, a right pen is used together with a graphical video display unit like a tablet or a mobile phone that is able to sense light shining on the screen using special hardware and software. A light pen does not emit light, but instead 
it reacts to the light emitted by the display using a photosensitive detector at its base. When the pen is moved across the screen, its position is sensed because of the light it produces. A light pen produces a direct input mode. It can be used to read data directly from the source document. It allows the user to point directly to an object on the screen, thus identifying the screen. Therefore, uh, let's look at how right pens are looks like in the next slide. Therefore, you can see a right pen in use. That is a right pen, on the other hand, and also uh, a stylus, how they look like. Therefore, this is uh, the right pen. Lastly, on the input devices, we can look at the smart board. This is not so much common, but uh, in high schools, uh, okay, some may have, but majority have never actually seen this, but today you see it in this, right? And also in the future, you may actually use them. We have a smart board. Other than now the whiteboard that we project uh, our projector, this is different. Therefore, a smart board is an interactive uh, board where computer actually it is an interactive board where the computer is directly connected to the board and therefore from the statement an interactive smart board shown below is connected to a computer the content from the computer is projected onto the surface of the smart board where the user control the computer and write using a special pen or finger pointing gestures Therefore, it is actually a good technology. Therefore, you can look at these images. Uh, you can see that kid trying to draw something there. Actually, that is the computer screen. But whatever you do there is saved in the computer. That is uh, how actually smart boards or interactive boards uh, look like. Then we can proceed to the next uh, subtopic which are uh, be looking at the central processing unit. Some people may ask, what is CPU? And when you talk about the central processing unit, it is the brain. In Raymond language, it is the brain of the computer, also known as the processor. Therefore, the central processing unit is also called the processor. It is responsible for processing and coordination of all the functions of the computer. On the other hand, the CPU is mounted. It is mounted on the motherboard. Later on, we shall also see uh, the motherboard. Then the CPU is subdivided into these parts shown here. We have the CU or the control unit. We have the arithmetic and logic unit and the main memory. See the figure below next. Therefore, the CPU is the brain or the processor. It is the brain of the computer. And it is divided into three functional parts. Control unit, arithmetic and logic unit, and the main memory. Therefore, let's see how it looks like. The, okay. Now, if you look at this diagram, uh, we have the CPU, and we have said it has three main parts. We have the, the main memory, then we have the control unit, and then we have the arithmetic and uh, logic unit. Now, this diagram uh, shows something that from the memory to the control unit, fetch data and instruction. Okay, the CPU is fetching data from the and instructions from the memory. The main memory is also called random access memory or RAM in capital letters. Then from there, special purpose memory, cache and registers. Okay, we shall look at the, those ones later. Therefore, you can see the, the main focus here is the, the main focus here is the main, the three main uh, parts of the CPU or the functional elements, we have the memory, 
CU control unit and the ARU. Therefore, let's see the, demo, the description of each. Let's start with the control unit. Now, the control unit or the CU acts as the manager of the computer. It, its main work is to control, supervise, and coordinate all the activities of various units of the computer, enabling the machine to perform useful tasks. Therefore, the control unit is the manager of the computer. It is supervises and coordinates all the activities. Next, the control unit carries out the fetching, the coding, and execution of instructions. It fetches or selects the required instructions from the main storage, store it in a number of special registers, interprets the instructions, and causes the instructions to be executed, executed by sending appropriate signals to the appropriate hardware devices. Therefore, for more on this, you can still uh, get these notes uh, later on. Then you can see the next part of the CPU. Okay, we have, I uh, want us to look at the next part, then you can review on the uh, this part here. Now let's look at the arithmetic and logic unit. Just like the word goes arithmetic, arithmetic is mathematics. And therefore, uh, this is the part of the processor that performs all the arithmetic operations. Arithmetic is mathematics, such as adding, multiplying, division, subtraction, this is the part of the CPU that does all. On the other hand, it also uh, do uh, things we call logic operations. Logic operations is to compare, like when you want to do something and compare whether something is true or false. If you want to ask what if, if then, when you want to compare uh, things in the computer, uh, the part that does the logical comparison, uh, comparisons or logical operations is called uh, the arithmetic logic unit and it's also the part that uh, performs mathematics. Then on the other hand, we can look at the functions of the ARU in depth. Therefore, it carries out the mathematics operations or the arithmetic, arithmetic operations. Number two, it performs the logical operations and comparisons of data. Those are the two main, actually, two main functions of the ARU. It carries out arithmetic operations. We have said you can also use the word mathematics operations. It also performs the logical operations uh, of, on data. Then we can go to the next part of the CPU. We have the main memory. The main memory or the primary storage. Later on, we shall look at this, the secondary storage. But for now, let's look at the computer main memory. Now, the computer main memory is divided into two. We have random access memory, that is RAM. We also have read-only memory, that is ROM. Don't confuse the two. Therefore, if you are asking an exam, uh, state two types of memories, we have RAM and ROM, that is random access memory and read only memory. Therefore, we shall look at each in depth. Let's start with the read only memory. Now, as the saying is going, read only memory. That means you cannot write in short, you can only read. Therefore, this is a memory that can only be read but cannot be written to. That is, the user can only read the information on it. On the other hand, read-only memory provides permanent storage of data. Since we have said you can only read, that means the whatever, whatever the manufacturer put there, you cannot change, and therefore its content are permanent. Then let's look at the functions of the read 
only memory. Number one, whatever the manufacturer writes on the memory that you cannot change, we call it firmware. And therefore, it stores the firmware. Therefore, firmware, these are the permanent or semi-permanent instructions that are written by the, the manufacturer on the ROM, on the read on the memory. Number two, it stores the system data and instructions that are necessary for normal functioning of the computer. When you are booting up your mobile phone or when you are booting your computer, you can see something like HP, Renovo, ESA version this and you cannot change that. Those are the, uh, the stored instructions we are talking about. It controls programs. On the other hand, it stores the BIOS. Uh, in the other topic, you learned about the BIOS, basic input uh, output system. The basic, the, the BIOS, the program called BIOS that helps the computer to boot is actually written in read only memory and therefore you cannot actually uh, change that one. Those are some of the main functions of uh, that one. Then, the, just like any other thing we have learned, the read only memories has its types and therefore it has several types. We have masked ROM, we have programmable read only memory, we call it PROM, we have erasable, programmable, read-only memory. We call it, we call it EP-ROM. Remember the last ROM means read-only memory. Then we have electrically erasable, programmable, read-only memory. Those are the main types of types of random, that is read-only memories. Don't confuse, we have masked read on the memory we have programmable read on the memory we have erasable programmable read on the memory therefore let's look at um, each and every type of rom we have electrically erasable programmable read on the memory eep rom this type of ROM can be erased and programmed electri electronically. An example of EP-ROM is the memory that stores the basic input-output system, that is the BIOS, that is used to initialize computer booter. Therefore, this can only be erased uh, using uh, electrical methods, that is electrically, and therefore it is among the electrically erasable programmable read only memory. Then it is also important to note that electrically erasable programmable uh, ROM, that is EEP ROM, is also called Flash BIOS. This ROM can be written, written through the use of special uh, software program that uses electrical passes. That's why we are just calling it uh, electrically erasable. Then we have the EP-ROM that is erasable, programmable, read-only memory. This is a type of read-only memory that can be reprogrammed a number of times by erasing it, its content using the sunlight or the ultraviolet light. Mark that it can be erased using the sunlight that is uh, the UV right. Uh, on the other hand, we have the PROM. PROM is the programmable read-only memory. This is read-only memory that can be programmed or customized directly by the user using a special PROM programmer to suit uh, or to suit the needs of a particular task. Customizing is the process by which a standard product is adapted for use in a particular situation. Make sure that one uh, is well understood. Then we have the masked, uh, we have the masked ROM. This is 
read only memory that can only be produced by the manufacturer. Therefore, this is permanent. Whatever the manufacturer has written, you cannot uh, really change. That is a uh, must uh, read only memory. Then we are done with the read only memory. We can go to a very interesting part and very important because this is actually what you need to understand more. Random access memory. Now memory goes to 100% and therefore the random access memory consists of 70%. The other one consists of 30%. Therefore, uh, here is where content is. Random access memory. It is a type of memory which is used by the computer to store data and programs temporarily during the times the machine is in operation. That is whatever you actually need to know. That when you are using a machine, like when you are running a computer game, or when you are typing a document, when you are playing music, all this stuff uh, runs uh, on read, that is random access memory. And it is very important for you to note that when the power goes off, those content or whatever you are doing goes off with the power. But the good news is there are some types of random access memory that when you, I was typing a document and then power goes off and then it is erased off, you can recover. Therefore, that capability is called uh, being volatile. We say random access memory is volatile. Volatile means it depends on power. And therefore, when power goes off, everything is rubbed off. That is very crucial to know. Uh, also, on the other hand, you need to know the uses of uh, random access memory. The random access memory, uh, the functions are, it stores data and instructions awaiting processing. Therefore, when you are doing something, like when you are typing a document that you have not saved, uh, we can say you are, it is waiting to be saved, the process of saving, and therefore uh, that one resides in the RAM, random access memory. Random access memory stores the instructions which are being obeyed or whose parts have been obeyed by the computer. It is also stores those instructions that have been processed and the ones that are waiting to be processed at the same time. It stores intermediate results. The results of computer working or calculations before they are communicated to the user through the output units. Now, if you are doing something like you are recording a music, now before you get your output data on the screen to see exactly what is happening, it is temporarily stored in the random access uh, memory. Therefore, those are some of the very important and crucial uh, points. Then we need to see types of RAM. Now we usually have two main types of RAM. We have SRAM and DRAM. S stands for static. Therefore, we have static random access memory. And we have a cousin called DRAM or dynamic random access memory. Now the difference is, let's start with static random access memory. Static random access memory is able to maintain its data as long as power is provided to the memory chip. It does not need to be rewritten periodically. In fact, the only time the data on the memory is refreshed or charged is when an actual write command is executed. SRAM is very fast and ARC and is currently being used in the main processor as a small amount of high-speed memory called cache or cache. You can pronounce it as cache memory. Therefore, the difference is when power goes off and then comes back almost immediately, you can retrieve your work from static RAM. But for the dynamic RAM, when power goes off, everything goes off forever. Therefore, let's confirm that. Dynamic RAM or DRAM. Dynamic RAM uses capacitors to store information. The other one there, we have stocked of memory chips. The information is stored in the capacitors as a charge. Like any charge, 
the electrical charges in individual memory capacitors of DRAM will drive away or leak, causing the data either to be lost or changed within a few milliseconds. Therefore, in short, in layman language, you are saying, when your machine operates in SRAM or static RAM and power goes off, you can, the chances are very high that you recover your work. But if your machine is using dynamic RAM, then power goes off, that means that is the end of that data. It goes forever. On the other hand, SRAM is fast, DRAM is slow. Then let's look at cache or cache memory as part of SRAM. I will read it as cache. Now we have three types of cache memory. We have uh, we have level one, level two, and level three. Therefore, level one is the primary memory cache because it's embedded inside a microprocessor. Then we have level two. Uh, level two is the external cache but may be installed inside the processor or between the processor and the DRAM. Then we have L3 or level 3. It, it is installed on the motherboard to support L2. That is the level 2 cache. Advantages and disadvantages of static RAM. Let's look at the advantages. One of the advantages of static RAM, it is much faster than DRAM. It is able to keep pace with the main processor. Number two, it doesn't require refresh cycles like DRAM, can retain this data forever. Therefore, those ones we had already mentioned. Then disadvantages, there are, uh, are overall data density. They, they doesn't store so much. On the other hand, SRAM cheap are physically large and more expensive uh, to purchase. Therefore, everything that has advantages, they have disadvantages. Then advantages are disadvantages of DRAM. Therefore, DRAM has much higher packing density than SRAM. DRAM are cheap. DRAM can store a lot of information in a very small space. Then we have the disadvantages, it is much slower, we had said that. It requires refreshing in order to maintain its content. On the other hand, the charge stored in the capacitor of a DRAM blinks and most of the charge cannot be retained for long. Therefore, those are just a few uh, of the, some of the disadvantages and advantages of uh, that one. Uh, the next subtopic, we can talk of special purpose memories. We have uh, memories included in the microprocessor or in the input output devices that enhance its performance. And therefore, uh, since you will be asked this in exams, name special memories, special purpose memories. Number one, we have the buffer. The buffer is one example, number two is the registers, and number three, and the last one is the cache memory. Therefore, we have those uh, three types of special purpose memories. We have buffers, we have registers, and then we have the cache. Then we can look uh, at them one by one. We have the buffer. Have you ever asked yourself, if you are sending something to the printer, how comes the printer is able to know that you sent a thousand pages? Or for example, let's use something logic. You have sent 50 pages. And then for example, power goes off, then comes back, resumes. Then you see the printer continue. We continue printing without forgetting. Therefore, that one is answered here. Uh, the printer, that is an output device or even a mouse, when you click, it is to that instruction then sets it to the CPU for uh, processing. They have some special memory called the buffer. And therefore buffer is a special memory that is found in input output devices. A buffer helps free the CPU to get on with other work where this 
when, uh, when the slower input output operations are completing just like i have explained your computer has sent 50 copies to the printer and therefore the printer holds that and relieves the cpu from those 50 copies as cpu process the other one then the printer can pick then we have registers register is a special memory that hold one piece of data at a time and we have examples of registers we have accumulator we have instruction register we have address register and storage registers therefore registers are just special memories that hold one piece of uh, instruction at any given time and therefore now i have enumerated them we have instruction register address register storage register and accumulator register therefore the instruction register it holds an instructions just before it is interpreted into a form that cpu can execute then the address register it temporarily holds the next page of data awaiting to be processed then now once processed the storage register temporarily holds a piece of data that is on its way to and from the cpu and the main memory then we have now the last one accumulator it holds temporarily the results of the last processing step of the arithmetic and logic unit therefore those are the four types of registers we have instruction register address register storage register and the accumulator therefore you can revise more and more to get this one uh, understandable then it is also very crucial for us to know how does computer measure memory how is memory measured uh, in a computer when i type a when i type one what does that one mean to the computer therefore let's look at a very interesting subtopic measuring the memory size of a computer the size of a computer's memory is the number of units of storage it contains and therefore we measure them using a one character one character in a computer is called a bit but when they reach eight they call a byte now a byte is a combination of word bit and eight and therefore a, a byte is eight bits but when it is more than now eight we call it a word and therefore the smallest unit of memory is called a bit and then eight of the bits we call them byte and therefore the measure of computer memory is a byte b-y-t-e a byte that is the smallest measure of computer memory therefore let's look at the sizes these are the sizes and therefore we have that uh, one byte is eight bits one kilobyte is equals to 1000 bytes 1 mb or 1 megabyte is 1 million bytes 1 gb you know gb we are talking of gb nowadays and mb 1 gb is actually 1 billion bytes 1 terabyte is 1 trillion bytes therefore that one is very well elaborated there and the last figures are the actual we usually approximate therefore one kilobyte is equal to 1024 but we approximate to uh, nearest that is a thousand and therefore we do a lot of rounding off therefore that's how memory sizes look like you can write them down we have one kilobyte is 1000 bytes one megabyte is one million bytes one gigabytes giga is billion Terra is trillion. Therefore, you can write that one and master them for easy uh, conversion. Then we can look at the functional organization of the CPU. Now, how does CPU communicate? How does CPU communicate with each other? Just like we people communicate using mobile phone via uh, service providers like Safaricom, Telecom, uh, you orange 
uh, blah 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 those ones therefore uh, the CPU is organized in such a way that data is communicated from one gadget to the other uh, therefore data in the computer is communicated using electric pathways called buses just like a normal bus and therefore you have three main types of buses we have data bus address bus and control bus therefore those are the just electric pathways where data passes through therefore you shall look at this therefore if you are asked how does cpu send data to the hard disk to the memory uh, you just answer and say they use electric pathways called buses which are of how many three types bus data bus address bus and control bus let's see the explanation data bus now data bus uh, when you talk about a uh, uh, data bus it is by that is means two ways uh, that is by directional means uh, two ways that means two ways bus therefore it is two ways it carries uh, data to and from that is what it means when you talk about uh, uh, by therefore it is a two directional bus that carry data to and from the the processor and therefore some people will tell you that data bus this is the bus through which the actual data transfer takes place that is data bus that the actual data uh, transfer takes place there then we have the casing address bus now address bus is one way it is a unidirectional bus and therefore address bus this is the pathway used to locate the storage location in memory where the next instruction or data to be processed is held rather it is a unidirectional one-way bus from the processor to the external devices it is usually contain the address of the memory location or device to be acted on by the processor it conveys addresses therefore it is just a one way then we have the last one control bus this is where all the timings all the controls from the cpu takes place it is one way therefore it is unidirectional one way bus that carries commands timing and control signals to the processor Therefore, it is a pathway for all timings and controlling functions sent by the control unit to other parts. Therefore, it is a one-way. And therefore, the only, that, the only one that is two-way is the, is the uh, data bus. Then from there, uh, don't forget we have three, we have agreed we have three types of, we have three types of bus that is the electric pathways we have control bus we have address bus and the data bus then this is a diagram showing the functional organization of the cpu and therefore we have input devices we have output devices on the other hand we have the control unit we have the arithmetic and logic unit main memory and then the backup or the secondary storage look at that diagram it is actually explaining how the cpu works it gets data from the input then process it inside itself produce the output on the device for the user to see and then the data from the computer is backed up to the storage uh, devices like external hard disk or flash disks or even memory cards then it is important for us to look at the types of processors that is we have talked of computer brain and therefore the computer brain or the processor is classified depending on the number of parameters basically we use two parameters we have the clock speed and the uh, 
width of the data bus or instruction set. The higher the clock speed, the higher the speed of the computer. The clock speed of a computer is measured in hertz, that is or hertz or megahertz. And therefore, the fast the clock, the fast the, the uh, that is the, the, the machine. Therefore, when you are buying a computer, look at the computer with the highest a clock speed. Then we can also look at bandwidth, that is bus width. The, the size of data bus determines the bus width of the processor. It indicates the moving capacity of information to the chips. Higher bus widths provide higher computer performance. Therefore, when you're talking, we are talking of nowadays the at the bus width, we have 64 bit, 32 bit, etc. And therefore, the higher the, the bus width, the higher the processing speed of that machine. On the other hand, uh, you can look at this diagram at your own time. That is the type of processor and the clock speed. That's from where we started 1971 or the way to. Uh, 2009. Nowadays we are talking of iCore 7, iCore 5, but we have come from Pentium. We had Intel this, Intel the other one, there yeah, were Intel 88. Then we came to Pentium 1, Pentium 2, Pentium 3, Dua Core. Now we are talking of somebody tells you my machine is iCore 5, 7 generation. Therefore, make sure you take this one as food for thought. You can look at that diagram in depth for your own uh, consumption. Then, classification of computer processors according to instruction set. We have CISC and RISC. Now, CISC, is, uh, that is, sorry, C-I-S-C, -S -C, stands for Complex Instruction Set Computer. The other one stands for reduced instruction set computer. And therefore, you can also classify computer brain or processors according to instructions set. That is, uh, we have complex instruction set processors and reduced instructions set processors. Therefore, the uh, Complex instruction set computers, they process more instructions compared to reduced set uh, computers. Therefore, it's also important for us to uh, know that. But it is very crucial for us to know that reduced instruction set computer machines are much faster than microprocessor based machines. That is a very crucial uh, point to note. Uh, from there, we are done with the CPU and uh, we go to a more and more now interesting subtopic, output devices. Now remember our topic, computer systems, uh, we said that the computer hardware is classified into four. Input devices, output devices, storage devices, and the CPU. Therefore, so far we have covered the CPU, we have covered the input devices, now we are in our third point, output devices. What are output devices? That is a very crucial point. An output device provides the user with the resource from the computer. Assume a situation whereby you are typing and there is no screen. You are listening music and there are no speakers. Then you are doing the useless thing because you cannot listen to the music. You are playing video, but you cannot see the video. Therefore, output devices are very crucial. Therefore, an output device is a device that provides the user with the results of what the computer is doing. Now, we classify output devices into two. We have hard copy output device. Next, we have soft copy output device. But before we go to that, we need to define the term hard copy. We need to define the term soft copy. 
a hard copy, just like the word goes. When you have something that you can touch and feel, that is a hard copy. Like when I give you an exam question paper, it is a hard copy. When I give you a newspaper, it's a hard copy. But when you go to the teacher's machine where the exam was set, you can still see the exam in the computer screen, but you cannot touch. That is a soft copy. And therefore, definition, a hard copy is a touchable or a touchable printed copy. A touchable or tangible copy. A soft copy is an intangible copy. A computer game is a soft copy. And your music in the video, it's a soft copy. But a printed question paper or a calendar is a hard copy. Therefore, gadgets that produce soft copy are called soft copy output devices. Uh, the ones that provide hard copy are called hard copy output devices. And therefore, let's look each and every. Let's start with the soft copy output uh, devices. Soft copy output. This is where the end results are displayed on a screen. The user can see the results but cannot touch them. The output runs for a short time only. It is available only as long as it appears on the screen. Therefore, that is very well understood. Examples of soft copy output devices, we have the video. Video stands for visual display units or monitor or the screen. For examples, we have the screen, we have speakers or audio response units. Uh, audio response units, something like the speakers. Then uh, that is the speakers. Then you can talk of, um, we can have the computer projector. We can have uh, right emitting diodes. We can have, um, uh, that is the monitor. Then we can look at the Hard, uh, that is hard copy output. Hard copy implies that the output is permanent. It can be retained for indefinite period of time. The user can see and touch the results. Then examples, we have printers. We have graphical plotters. We have microphones. It is, we shall see them in details. Therefore, you can see, let's see now in depth, soft copy output devices. Now we see in depth, we start with the monitor. Now we, you, have, uh, you have always and every time watched a television. Uh, in your, you usually use your mobile phone to access Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, your text messages. Therefore, here, uh, or that one takes to our topic. On the other hand, when you're using a computer, you cannot do anything without a monitor. And therefore, monitor is one of the uh, most useful visual display unit. And therefore, we need to read about the monitor in depth. Monitors, are classified according to the technologies they use. We have cathode ray tubes found uh, in most desktop of microcomputers. Now we have screens, the, the old screens that looks like they have a, a protruding back. Those ones are the cathode ray tubes. You shall see them later. Then you shall have the flat screens. Now flat panel screens or flat screens are classified into several. Uh, we usually have found in most desktop computers. Therefore, we shall be looking at that. Uh, cathode ray tube is a display that uh, usually have a protruding back and it's actually almost out of market as we speak. Then we have the liquid crystal display, right emitting diode and gas plasma. These ones, we call them flat panel. They are flat screens. Only that the the technology used is different. Like for example, the crystal display, the LCD, uh, used by laptops and notepads, they use liquid crystals for backlighting the screens. 
whereas the write emitting diodes they use diodes for back writing then you have the gas plasma display they contain millions of pixels that are illuminated by charged neon gas they do not suffer from angle distortion therefore the best advantage of gas plasma flat screens they don't suffer from angle distortion then uh, it is crucial for us to uh, also know that um, the display technologies that is uh, the display terminologies that are used are also the factors to consider for example somebody may ask you what are the factors to consider when purchasing a monitor therefore I re those ones will be answered by the display technologies therefore you can determine by looking at the uh, pixel number of pixels the color depth the resolution refresh rate or display size and therefore pixels the term pixel stands for picture elements these are tiny dots used to form the images displayed on the screen therefore the higher the number of pixels the clearer or the higher the clarity then you can talk of the color depth uh, this refers to the number of colors that can be displayed by a pixel called color depth it is measured in binary digits or bits then we have the resolution the resolution is the pixels per inch therefore the higher the resolution the clearer the, clear the, the images then we have the refresh rate this is common in the cathode ray tubes therefore it is used to constantly refresh the one and on, uh, that is the pixels of the screen as long as that is as much as necessary to make sure that the pictures are more clear then somebody may ask you when you are purchasing a screen uh, everybody else will go for the biggest screen and therefore the display size is measured diagonally that one is also a very crucial point for you to understand then you can look at the advantages of uh, that is the advantages of LCD liquid crystal display over the CRT the, that is the cathode ray tube now the screen of LCD is much thinner and smaller that is uh, therefore it will be easy for you to carry over then LCD screen come in 14 to 15 inches uh, and the others probably they are even smaller than that and uh, that is only slightly smaller than the 17 inch CRT that probably can be found in the market therefore these ones are, are affordable the everybody else can actually get his uh, his taste LCDs have no frica uh, people call it rice into uh, quotes rice and cherry therefore LCD doesn't have recurring on the other hand they consume raw power the, the flat screens consume raw power compared to the CRT because of the refresh rate then for the screen to be connected to the system unit they use a part called the uh, adapter that is uh, we have the adapter and uh, adapter come from different or from various uh, they range from various types display adapter card also called the video card or the graphic card the real brain of a display operation is the video card it is inserted into the slot on your computer's motherboard as an expansion card it then speaks to the monitor about what the computer is asking it to do therefore the point of interaction between the the CPU that is from the system unit to the monitor uh, is done through the video card and therefore the video card which is also called the display adapter card comes in various uh, types and therefore we shall also be looking at that then before we go to those ones let's see how uh, the monitor works that is how the monitor works it's also very important for us to see how the monitor works therefore the inner surface of the screen is coated with a phosphorus material that emits or produces light when struck by an electric beam whenever the electrons hit the the phosphor it grows 
producing images. When the monitor is plugged into the video card, it gets a scan frequency, giving the timing of the screen redraws. The electron beam must cross the screen in synchronization with the scan and signal of the video card. The beam starts at the top left of the screen, crossing to the right. As it does this, it exceeds the, uh, the phosphor dots. On reaching the right side of the screen, it returns to the left side in order to refresh the, right, the line of pixels underneath the first one. Therefore, you can read more on that one since it is not so much uh, important in this actually uh, concept. Therefore, let's skip to that and uh, look at types of monitors or display or video adapters that we have talked about. Therefore, there are several. Let me uh, enumerate them, then we can go uh, through them. Uh, we have color graphic adapter or CGA. Therefore, when you talk about the CGA, that is the color graphic adapter, this is the easiest type of adapter introduced in the International Business Machine, that is IBM, in 1981 to display graphic using colors. Therefore, this was just introduced to remove the black and white and bring the color. It was later replaced with enhanced graphic adapter EGA. This adapter was improvement of SGA but also display 16, uh, it display 16 colors. Therefore, it, is, it didn't actually have so many colors that are like uh, we actually we would have actually wanted. Then we have the VGA, the Videographic Array. This was produced by the International Business Machine, that is IBM, in 1987 to display text. The aim of VGA was to display text, graphics, and video using 256 colors. The other one we have seen is 16, uh, that is 16 colors. Therefore, VGA could support 256 colors, which was replaced by Super Video Graphic Adapter, or you can also say Super Video Graphic Array. Adapter and Array is okay. This was an, an enhancement of VGA that displayed text and graphics using more than 16 million colors. Therefore, you can see that one was a very good actually improvement. This now was replaced by another one called Extended Graphic Array, which supports a resolution of 1024 times 768 pixels. This now is also replaced by a higher resolution of 1600 times 1200 resolution called Ultra Extra Graphic array therefore this one you need you need to read more and more and more otherwise it is just a complicated concept that um, can only be understood by reading more and more and more then we can proceed to our next soft copy output device we have the voice sound or voice you can still call it the way you wish both of those ones are around the first look at voice output now, voice output or audio response units, information from the computer memory, which is in electronic form, um, is actually transmitted using waveforms. That is sound that can be heard. The sound can be spoken language, music notes or beeps. This output is obviously soft copy. You can agree with me. Uh, whether the machine, whether it is actually spoken language, music notes, beeps, when the machine beeps, those ones are actually soft copy since you cannot touch, but you can actually hear. Voice output is useful where reading is not necessary. That point is very crucial. You can be asked to give instances where sound output is necessary, and therefore voice output is useful where reading is not necessary or is impossible and where fast output is required those are the two actually main points as to why you may opt to use voice that is where reading is not necessary and where fast output is required for example voice output is used as a running aid 
In emergency situations for messages in answering services, e.g. post office, uh, talking clocks, when uh, audio respond unit is used to produce speech, it is called speech synthesizer. Therefore, when you use uh, audio respond unit to produce a speech, then it is called speech synthesizer. A speech synthesizer is useful form of, of output, especially when communication with a computer is made using telephone lines. Then we can look at the advantages of voice output, then disadvantages. It is very fast. You can agree with me it is very fast to use voice. Can it be used for distant communication, e.g. through telephone lines. It is useful where reading is impossible. Errors are easily corrected. Therefore, if you make a mistake uh, where speaking or recording voice, then you can make uh, a correction within no time. Disadvantages. The output is not permanent. It may be boring, especially for uh, prolonged output. Somebody may repeat himself or herself so much cannot be used by people with hearing problems. That's very good. People with hearing problems may not actually understand what you are saying. If the message is conveyed through beeps, it may be hard to understand. Assume a situation whereby uh, two beeps in a computer means something different. Three beeps in a computer are different. Now it will be very hard for you to comprehend all those. That's what actually is being uh, conveyed there. Then on the other hand, we have projectors. Uh, we may have projectors. You know how projectors actually work. Therefore, these are the projectors. You can look at this one. Therefore, a projector is a soft copy output device that uh, actually produces its output on a brain wall. They are used to display output from a computer onto a brain screen or wall. Therefore, we have uh, we have seen they have projectors look like. These are the examples of projectors you have probably seen your teacher using them, or even in, at your church or mosque. You have seen them when the uh, religious leaders are teaching the youths or other people. Then we have uh, right emitting diodes. When a computer is booting. How do you tell that the computer is booting? You usually see some lights, green or red, beeping. Those ones are actually uh, blinking, sorry. Those are the right. And therefore, hard copy output devices, these are devices that help you to produce uh, output that you can touch. And uh, for that case, uh, we, ha we have several. We talked of printers. We talked of protas, we talked of fax mile or fax, though they are nowadays not used. Therefore, let's look at printers. A printer is an output device that facilitates the transfer of information from a computer to a paper. That one is enough explanation that a printer is used to convert soft copy to hard copy. There are several uh, classifications of printers. We can classify printers uh, depending on uh, several points. And therefore, printers are basically classified in three ways. In terms of print speed, we have high speed printers, we have low speed printers. Number two, according to text, it can print per given period of time. And therefore, we have character printers, we have rind printers. And we have page printers. Don't forget that we have high speed printers or slow speed. Then, on the other hand, we have character printers, rind printers, and also um, uh, page printers. Then, the method used to produce the characters. Um, the last classification here in many books, they use the, the last point to classify printers. That is the method used to produce the characters. We have impact printers and non-impact 
printers. Therefore, basically, in case you asked two main classification, just talk of impact printers and non impact printers because every other else, that is, every other classifications above, we refer other impact and uh, that is impact and uh, non impact printers. Then, from that point, it is also important for us now to uh, look at the the printers according now to whether it is a page printer, a rain printer, or a character printer. Therefore, character printers are usually raw speed printers that print one character at a time. They are comparatively slow and less costly than rain or page printers. Have printing speed that vary from 10 to 200 characters per second. They usually use the DC wheel or dot matrix printing mechanism. We shall see that. Then we have right printers. They usually print one whole line at a time. They are more expensive than the character printers, but less costly uh, compared to page printers. Then we have page printers. They print a whole page at a time, and therefore they are very fast. Then from there, we can go to uh, see the next method. Therefore, I, we have agreed that in case in an exam, you are asked, you are asked about uh, classifying two main methods of classifying printers. Forget about the others. Just talk of impact and non-impact printers. Therefore, impact printers, uh, they are printers that work by use of the striking mechanism therefore when we talk about impact printers uh, to in a nutshell impact printers print using striking mechanisms this means that the printing head strike the paper in order to form an imprint on it and therefore for that case we have two examples of impact printers we shall look at them we have dot matrix printers and daisy wheel in our next slide we shall see that then when you talk about uh, non impact printers these are printers that are faster quieter that is uh, than the impact printers they print using ink thermo or laser mechanisms just like the explanation here uh, goes examples of impact printers just like i have promised we have dot matrix dot matrix printers produce each character by printing the appropriate dot combination shaped character printers produce each character by use of whole character symbol just like a, an ordinary typewriter therefore this is an example of a dot matrix printer and also the other one the second one is the most uh, that picture is actually nice. It is showing you how invoices are printed in the banks. You have ever visited a bank and they hear very noisy printers that are very slow. Those are the dot matrix. Then the second example of impact printer is the daisy wheel. Now a daisy wheel has a removable flower-like wheel consisting of spokes with embossed characters. When printing, the wheel is rotated to align the required character and then the character is hit by the printing head with a hammer. Therefore, this is how it looks like. These are the examples of uh, daisy wheel if you have never seen one. Therefore, if you find such printers, these are the uh, daisy wheel printers. Therefore, those are the two examples of non-impact printers then we go to the modern printers we call them non-impact printers we have said non-impact printers these are the are the printers that are fast they are faster and quieter than the impact printers they print using ink thermo or racer technologies therefore you can see the examples we have inkjet thermo printers and laser printers. Therefore, ink jet printers, they use ink cartridges to print by spraying ink on a paper. 
whereas the thermal printers they use the thermal technology to heat the ink before fusing it on the paper they are used in point of sale that is like in supermarkets to print receipts then we have these ones that are all over in our offices we call them laser printers they use toner therefore they use a beam they use a beam of concentrated light that is laser beam to fuse the toner on a piece of paper when the laser beam hits a rotating drum it ionizes regions which attract ink toner uh, which then is fused on the paper therefore basically the most important thing here is to know that uh, what is an impact printer we have said they are quieter fast and use inkjet thermal or laser technologies and then you know the examples you have the inkjet thermal printers and the and the laser uh, printers then from that point we have 3d uh, printers therefore 3d printers they actually use like in hospitals to print skeletons uh, such things that is actually where they actually use when you are printing the bones the way the bone roots like the skeleton that is the uh, such and also they can also be used in sculpture industry 3d printers uh, used to produce high quality images printers from source such as memory cards optical disc or, or digital camera then you have plotters they are used to print large outputs like maps architectural drawings and billboards therefore see the images of uh, those uh, printers uh, but before probably we see the images the images will be in the next slide somebody may ask you uh, I want to send you and bring me a printer what are the factors to consider when choosing or buying a printer number one is the print quality just like we have gone through the printers we have agreed that printers print in different qualities and therefore the first thing you need to check is the printer quality it's the print quality uh, if you need very smart printing then go for a laser printer or a, a 3d printer then you can also took a look at the initial cost that is the buying cost and the cost of maintaining it that is call it running cost then on the other hand we have speed of printing we have looked at the speeds of printing therefore those are actually the four main points they are last but all of them fall under these four points that uh, we can talk of print quality initial cost running cost speed of printing that is measured paper per minute lastly you can also talk of color printing somebody may wish to buy a color printer for printing photos then you send somebody and bring a black and white uh, printer therefore you have to consider uh, color printing therefore from there we can now see the images this is an image of a 3d printer it is actually printing an elephant the other one is printing uh, a gazelle then we have protas yeah, this one is printing a map another one is printing a billboard therefore these are the examples of those high quality printers protas protas are the two below the ones above are the 3d printing actually printing uh, whatever is needed there then we can go to our another part of our topic we call it secondary storage devices now we are done with uh, uh, primary storage and also the output uh, devices therefore secondary means backup or you can just talk it uh, talk of auxiliary therefore secondary storage is also known as auxiliary or backing memory or backing storage that means you are copying files from your primary storage to secondary that is you are keeping them safe in the case of an emergency you can go for uh, that uh, copy there therefore what are the classifications of secondary storage when we classify backup or secondary storage you can have removable remember you have said this is uh, data you want to keep somewhere different from the primary storage 
therefore you may opt to keep it inside your laptop uh, inside a fixed storage media like the hard disk or you can opt to carry it using a flash disk therefore classification of storage sto uh, of secondary storage we have removable storage we have fixed storage that is therefore you need also to know then from the fixed storage you can talk of two technologies you can talk of magnetic technology and optical technology therefore uh, in magnetic technology we have magnetic disks like now the cassettes the tapes that you used to keep movies in uh, in some other uh, ancient days or old days therefore we can also look at magnetic disks now a magnetic disk is a round platter made of a plastic or a metallic and coated with magnetic material which is used for storage of information therefore magnetic disk storage uh, a storage it is a storage device or system consisting of magnetically coated disks on the surface of which information is stored in the form of magnetic spots arranged in a manner to represent binary data the data are arranged in a circular track around the disk and accessible to reading and writing heads on an arm which can be moved mechanically to the desired disk and then to desired tracks then uh, magnetic disk can be of two forms we have floppy disketes and hard disks uh, in a few days in a few years ago before the cds dvds and the modern flash disk came over uh, people used to use floppy disketes therefore we had a gadget that i will show you next called uh, floppy floppy had a memory of 1.44 mb therefore you can you can imagine 1.44 mb compared with what we have nowadays in terms of terabytes uh, that is a trillion bytes therefore we had magnetic disks of floppy disk and hard disk the first start by just reviewing we are here because of history and that's why you have to learn about floppy disk now a floppy disk is a disk that can be inserted and removed from a disk drive now unfortunately most of our machines computers that we have today uh, doesn't even have a slot to insert the floppy disk now floppy disk was um, 3.5 inches and it had a memory of 1.44 mb that is uh, what is very important therefore this is the floppy uh, disk the one is a diagram one is a photo therefore the upper one those are the photos of floppy disk the next one is a diagram showing the parts of a floppy disk therefore it had somewhere to rock or unlock down there there was a button then it had the reading the, the storing service that is where we have the speed hold at the rebel region that's where the piece of magnetic paper was placed where data was recorded then it had a metallic part for reading that is the read write region up there therefore in case you are told to draw a floppy disk that's how it looks like both a diagram and a photo then from there we can look at the optical disks that is the we have uh, talked of magnetic and optical disk now this these ones are very familiar to you uh, on your right we have dvds dvds are purple in color like that the other one is with the transparent or shiny surface are cds but they are of the same size in terms of diameter because they are read by the same reader therefore optical disks use right they use right to uh, record data and therefore it is important for us to note that um, cds and dvds allows you to write once and read many times and therefore we term that one as warm warm is the technology used by dvds and cds that is you write once and read many times that is warm then cds and dvds are very similar they, they we have cd recordable we also have dvd recordable 
The only difference between a CD and DVD is the memory capacity. CD may contain 700 MB, whereas a DVD may go up to 17 GB, but the normal ones are 4.7 GB. Also, CDs come into a format that you can erase called CD RW or CD Write. It is also very important to note that we also have DVD. DVD stands for Digital Versatile Discs or Digital Video Disc. And uh, we also have Blu-ray Discs with high capacities of 17 to 50 GB respectively. That is also very important. At your own time, you can read about uh, Blu-ray Discs and also DVDs. Then we have advantages of CDRW. Now, when we talk about a CDRW, the, the RW at the end uh, means rewritable. Used, uh, they are used when you need to erase the data and rewrite new information, that is updating files. Data written to a CDRW is not permanent. It can be overwritten or erased. CDRW are used to make a practice CD or test by the contents. Like now, the students can be given those ones since they will still write and uh, remove. The more, more, more cost effective for nearing data storage. They actually more, more okay. They are expensive, but in terms of cost effectiveness, they are because you actually uh, remove them. You will just erase and and uh, rewrite. Then we can also talk of a very important subtopic, solid state storage media. These are flash disks. You are all aware of how flash disks look like, especially the scan disk and the, the others. You have actually seen them. Therefore, solid state storage media refers to an unvolatile uh, storage that uses integrated circuits rather than mechanical or magnetic or optical technology to record and read data. Therefore, never confuse. Flash disks are examples of, uh, that is flash disk and memory cards. They don't use mechanical, magnetic or optical technology. Rather, they use integrated circuits to record data. That's why we are referring them as solid state storage media. It is very important to note that. Therefore, you get somebody uh, telling you that flash disk use magnetic technology or optical. That is not true. Then, how do we handle magnetic media? You should store your magnetic media on low temperatures. You should know that. You should never drop uh, or just hit with a hammer or with a hard object the magnetic media. You should never keep your magnetic media on a stronger like a, on another stronger magnetic media, you should also avoid the heating them. That is pressing them on the heat and also pressing them places where there is dust. Therefore, you need to know that. Put on the power before mounting the media and off after removing the media. Therefore, make sure you adhere to those precautions. And also for the purpose of an exam, you can be asked that. Then uh, we have fixed storage media. This is our last part of uh, storage. Remember, we talked of input devices, output devices, CPU, and now we are in the last part, the storage devices, where we have looked at the magnetic storage, we have looked at optical storage, we have looked at solid state storage, we have also looked at fixed uh, now storage medium. Inside your computer, you have a gadget called HDD or hard disk or hard drive. Therefore, it is actually fixed. You cannot remove. And if you remove, then the machine cannot store data. That's why we are, called, uh, we are calling it fixed storage media. Therefore, these are the hard disks. And one is labeled. We have the disk platter, read stroke, uh, re uh, rewrite stroke, read head. We have the hard disk casing. Therefore, this is a good example of uh, how hard disk screw cracks. And therefore, this category is fixed or mounted inside the system unit of a microcomputer. Example is the hard disk, which is also known as hard drive. A hard disk consists of one or more metallic platters 
you have seen them there they have been labeled stacked on top of each other but but not touch one another to form a serida the stack of pratas is attached to a rotating pole called spido spido as the disc rotates the reed stroke head right moves in and out over the surface of the disc to read or write data therefore in an exam if you are asked to explain how hard disk writes or reads data you should actually explain the last statement there that as the disc rotates the read right head moves in and out over the surface of the disc platter to read or write data you can still read more uh, on hard disk from your uh, uh, smartphones you can just google on how hard disk works then uh, we also need to, uh, to look at power and interface connectors first of all how does computer get power from now the mains and since gadgets inside the computer use direct current just like in televisions and other gadgets how is that achieved it is achieved by use of this gadget i'm showing you here this gadget is called the power supply unit it is located at the back of your uh, computer therefore if you look at the back of your computer you will see this gadget it is called the power supply unit it converts the alternate current that the ac from the main to the dc that is basically its work just to regulate power it is a, like a step down transformer then we can go ahead and look at the cables if you look at the back of your computer there are various ports ports we don't call them holes they are actually ports where these wires or cables we don't call them wires we call them cables therefore we have parallel cables usb cables and serial cables the ones that i'm showing you here these are the the ones with the blue are actually parallel cables then the other ones on the left are serial serial the parallel are the ones with the blue and therefore there are cables that transmit data simultaneously using a set of eight conductor wires if a parallel cable uses eight lines to transmit data at the same time it is said to be eight bit parallel cable therefore remember the ones that are on your left with the blue are the parallel cables then we have also said we have serial cables now serial cables they transmit one bit at a time but very fast and at a very long distance in case you ask the advantages of serial they transmit one bit at a time but very fast and up to a distance of 15 meters away therefore you can see uh, these are the serial the serial have pins they are male parallel are female therefore on the other side we had both parallel and a serial but here i have specialized i have only given you the serial therefore serial cables are male therefore you can see they have pins they transmit one bit at a time but in a very fast way and also for a long distance then you can look at these ones these are the cable called vga they are called vga cables they are used to connect the monitor to the system unit they are blue in color in most cases Okay, you may get black and white, but in most cases they are uh, this color. They are used to connect the monitor to the system unit. Uh, that is a complete one. From one edge to the other, they look the same and have the same number of pins. Then we can look at upcoming technology. We have the HDMI. HDMI stands for High Definition Multimedia Interface. It is the latest interface for transmitting both audio and video at a high speed and also at a high quality. Therefore, this is the HDMI. It looks like that. Then, uh, on the other hand, we have audio interface. You have ever seen this? These ones are used to connect speakers, microphone, and other audio interfaces. They are used to uh, actually transmit audio. Therefore, that's how they look like. On the other hand, we have Bluetooth and wireless uh, connectors. Therefore, they have that sign. Those are the wireless. 
Then you also need to see ports and interface symbols. If you look at the back of your computer, you will see these things. Therefore, you need to know what they mean. The first one, if you see that those uh, symbol, that symbol, it is called parallel. That is to tell you that you insert or connect parallel cable or that is parallel cable there. The other one, it, it tells you that you are connecting serial. That is a serial uh, gadget there. The other one is USB. You are conversant with that one. That one tells you that you are actually connecting a USB. The other one is not so much used. That is a small computer system interface. That one can be used to connect keyboard and mouse at the same time or in the same port. Then you have also probably not seen this, but when you open inside the computer, this is how motherboard looks like. Therefore, this is a motherboard. It looks like a city. If you look at it, it looks like Nairobi or any other city from above. That is a motherboard. Motherboard looks like that. This is a disconnected motherboard. You can see they also have the ports. Then from here, we go to our last part of this topic. Now, remember, uh, the topic was about computers. It is th therefore, you can just say that computer software refers to the programs. We classify computer software according to three parameters, according to purpose, according to acquisition, how you acquire it, or the license you have, the end user license. Therefore, we classify using three parameters, purpose, acquisition, and end user a license. Therefore, let's look at the classification of computers according to purpose. Computer software can be broadly classified or divided into two. That is according to purpose. We have a system software and application software. That is according to uh, purpose. Note, programming languages can also be considered as part of software because they form the basis of grammar of which programs development is based. But for our syllabus uh, purposes, let's basically say classification of computer uh, computers uh, software according to purpose. We have system software and classification and uh, application software. Therefore, uh, from that point, we can go ahead and look according to purpose. That is system software and the application software. Now, what is system software? This is a set of programs which is developed and installed in a computer system for the purpose of developing other programs and to enhance the functional capabilities of the computer system. System programs control the operation of various hardware parts and make them available for the user. In short, system software enhance the interaction between the hardware and the and the software that is the hardware and the software then from there uh, we can see the functions of the system software booting the computer and making sure that all hardware elements are working properly the first function of a system software is to make sure that the computer start up without any problem Number two, it makes sure that other programs are running smoothly. Number three, it helps you to store and retrieve files. If I saved a file yesterday and I want to get it, that smoothness is made possible by the system software. Number four, performing operations such as retrieving, loading, executing, and storing application programs. Therefore, when you talk about um, uh, uh, loading a program, you see uh, my programs are loading fast, then that is made by system software. Then system software can further be classified into the following. You need to know that operating system, that is number one. Therefore, we can still classify system software according to operating system firmware network operating system and utility software as, as we see them one by one. When you talk about operating system, this is the main program 
that controls or other programs like Windows. You can talk of my machine has Windows XP, my phone has Android. Those are the operating system. Then we have utility software as the next classification of system software. These are programs that make everything else to run smoothly. And therefore, utility program performs a general useful task. That is, they make sure that every other program is actually running smoothly. Some of the common utility programs, like now searching, when you are searching a program, when you are spell checking a program, that one is actually activity of your utility software. The next one is firmware. Therefore, we classify a system software as firmware, utility software, operating system, and network. And uh, yeah, network. We have network also operating system as part of it. Then we have firmware or micro program. Where somewhere we said that firmware are permanent or semi permanent programs that are saved by the manufacturer, e.g. BIOS. Therefore, firmware is also part of it. Then we have network operating system. This facilitates the communication between two or more computers by connecting them using a communication channel like a cable or wireless capability. And therefore, before we go to the next classification, system software is classified as network operating system firmware operating system and utility software then we can also have now before we tackle this uh, don't get confused this is a very confusing concept if you don't understand software is the hardest part of this topic and therefore you you really must read and read and read and read for you to get grasp the concept we have said computer software uh, is classified according to acquisition Add user license and purpose and therefore according to purpose we have said we classify software as application software and system software and then we have said the system software is further classified into network operating system operating system utility uh, system and firmware now we are in our second classification of according to purpose that is application software in rayman language application software are the computer packages these are our computer applications simple these are applications that make you to solve specific problems like typing like keeping data that is database uh, calculation doing calculations spreadsheets etc and therefore we shall look at the examples therefore we usually have word processors we have spreadsheets, uh, we have database management system, we have graphic, uh, graphics programs, we have desktop publisher. Then we shall look at them in a table format, then computer data design. These are the just explanations, but uh, we need to have this table. Now this table explains everything at once. Therefore, application software. We have word processors, then we have spreadsheets, we have desktop publishing, we have computer aided design, we have databases and the graphical software. Therefore, word processors are used to type. Therefore, if you go to our last slide, you'll get that word processors is a computer system with a special piece of software used for production of documents then we have spreadsheets they are used for manipulation of figures then we have a database it is used to keep data on related uh, 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 that is on related topic then for this schedule we have word processor and examples like now word processor we have Microsoft Word we have Word Pro open office Spreadsheet, we have Microsoft Excel, we have Open Office Calc. Desktop, we have Microsoft Publisher, Adobe. On the other hand, Computer Aided Design, we have AutoCAD, ArchiCAD. Database, we have Access, MySQL, Oracle, Foxbase, Paradox, etc. Therefore, these ones, you can just um, 
revise, revise, revise. There is no shortcut. Otherwise, I have told you this is the most confusing and difficult part of this topic. Software. Students get difficulties and therefore you need to read and read and read and read. There is no shortcut for you to understand and grasp these concepts. Then from there, uh, classifications according to acquisition. Now we are we are done with uh, classification according to uh, purpose. Therefore, let's see. How do we classify software according to how you acquire them? There are two main ways. You can call somebody to your home or to your organization to prepare for you a software as you wish. If you call somebody to prepare for you a software, then we call that software in-house developed or best bespoke or tailor-made. Therefore, an in-house software is a software that you call somebody to create for you. And then you may opt not to call somebody but to buy. That one is called vendor of the shelf or standard software. And many people go for uh, vendor of the shelf. It is the same case when you are buying clothes. You may go to a tailor and tell a tailor to, uh, to sue you or to make you a cloth or a suit. You may also opt to go to supermarket and buy a ready-made cloth. The same case applies here. Therefore, we have in-house developed or bespoke or tailor-made. This is a program developed for a specific use. Then vendor of the shelf, uh, shelf or standard software are programs developed by the software manufacturers and distributed for sale. Example, we have Adobe Master Collection, we have Microsoft Office, etc. Then, it is important we look at the advantages of buying a software from the shelf or standard software. Those ones are easy to install, they are cheap, they are actually readily available, and also they have minor or no errors. Those are some of the advantages. On the other hand, everything that has advantages must have uh, disadvantages and therefore we can also go ahead and look at the disadvantages uh, of uh, these softwares that are act actually uh, bought if you buy something because it was not made for you they may lack some features required by you they may also have so many features that you do not use they may have some features not needed by the user they may require the user to change processes and hardware for compatibility, which may in turn be expensive. Therefore, like for example, you can your machine may not be supporting Office 2019, and then you purchase Office 2019. You will be required again to get uh, a computer technician to upgrade your operating system to accept the the office that you have bought that's what you are talking about it is actually uh, expensive then our last classification is classification according to user license agreement and for that case we usually have proprietary we have open source we have freeware and we have shareware Therefore, classification according to the user license, this is how you acquire it. Uh, have you been given a free license? Have you been given a license to try for 30 days or 90 days and then it expires? That's what we are talking about. And therefore, we have proprietary software. Now, proprietary software is owned by an individual or a company, uh, usually the one that developed it. They are almost always uh, major, there is always major restrictions to use it and, it and its source code is always kept secret. Something like Microsoft Office, it, it can never be yours, it, owns, it is owned by Microsoft. You, are only, you only buy license to use and you can never get its source code. That means it is proprietary, it is owned by the company that made it. But there are other softwares that are called open source software or OSS. This is any computer software that is distributed with its source code available for modification. That means it is usually 
it, it usually includes a license for programmers to change the software in any way they choose. They can fix errors, errors are called bugs. They can improve functions or adapt the software to suit their own needs. Therefore, when somebody uh, buys an unproprietary or an open source software, he or she is given even the code. You can modify it to make you, it yours or to make it function the way you want. But proprietary, you can only use the way the manufacturer made it. On the other hand, we have Rebo software or free software. This is distributed at terms that allow users to run the software for any purpose, as well as to study, change, and distribute it in any adapted versions. A freeware, you can give your friends for free. You can use it for any method, anything you want, but nobody can actually arrest you for violating the copyright. Then we have the last one is called shareware. Don't confuse freeware and shareware. Now shareware is distributed free on trial basis. You can be given a software, it's also called a rightware, a rightware. You can be given as a software for that days to try with all functionalities. Then after that days, you need to buy it. That is the license agreement that I give you for 90 days, then you can purchase. That is a share. But freeware, you can be given forever. Then as we uh, wrap up our topic, we need to see criteria for selecting computers. And uh, we classify it into two. We have hardware considerations and uh, software consideration. Now when you need to buy a computer or to choose a computer for your organization or for yourself, you must consider two major criterion. Number one is hardware, the hardware part. Number two is the software part. Let's start with the hardware part. That is criteria for selecting computers. We have hardware consideration. Now number one, you must identify the processor speed. You cannot just buy a computer that is will be hanging every now and then. Therefore, you must identify the processor type. E.g., you can go for i Core 7, processor speed, for example, of 3 gigahertz. Then memory capacity, the larger the memory, the faster the machine. You can go for a machine with 8 GB RAM, that is random access memory. Then you can also look at the warranty. Uh, the warranty is the agreement between the seller and the buyer, uh, sparing terms and conditions in case the gadget is not functioning. If the gadget is an unfunctional, you can return for repair or for exchange. That is warranty. Then cost. Always do window shopping. If you are, you are buying a laptop, go for three to four shops and compare. The same laptop, how does it cost? You may get a difference of 5K. And if you purchase in the first shop, you would have lost the 5K. Then also buy a machine that can be upgraded other than buying a new one. Like for example, you can buy a laptop with 8 GB RAM and when 16 GB RAM is available, you can remove the 8 and insert the 16 other than selling them or going for a new one with 16. Therefore, don't buy a rigid machine that cannot be upgraded. Then when you talk about compatibility, there are some machines that cannot work with devices or gadgets from other companies. Buy a computer that can, that can accept any spare part from any other, other uh, company. Uh, here we don't talk about spare part but we talk about gadgets. Like you can buy a Lenovo computer that, that can work with uh, HP keyboard, HP monitor, HP mouse. That's what we are talking about uh, compatibility. On the other hand, we have portability. Portability in hardware means whether the hardware can be carried from one place to the other. That's what we are talking, uh, talking about uh, uh, portability. Don't buy, don't buy a very heavy machine that cannot be, that will give you a headache when transporting from one place to the other. 
The other one is also special needs. If somebody is handicapped, make sure you buy him or her a machine that will serve their purpose. Rastre is multimedia capabilities. Always buy a machine that will help you to play music, text, video, as such. Therefore, when you talk about multimedia capability, this is the capability of a machine. Uh, this is the capability of a machine to play video, audio, text, etc. And therefore, it must have a sound card. Uh, it must have uh, a DVD or a CD player. It must have a card monitor that is a SVG such. Therefore, for more on uh, multimedia capabilities, you can do some research and uh, write them down. Then we also need to look at uh, software considerations. When you are buying uh, a machine, you must go for a software that is genuine and legitimate. That is called authenticity. Authenticity means that the software is genuine, it is legal, it is legitimate, it is acceptable, it is not pirated. Therefore, just go for a software that is genuine. On the other hand, buy a software with an explanation on how to use it. That is called documentation. Other people in layman language call it manual. Uh, you hear guys say, where is the manual for this software? That is a small booklet explaining how to use, how to install, how to debug that software. On the other hand, uh, you have to buy a software that meets what you want. Like for example, if I want to prepare, uh, if I want to prepare timetables, then I have to go for a timetabling software, not a word processing or a spreadsheet software. That is user requirements. You have to buy a software that uh, suits your needs. Just uh, um, on the other hand, buy a software that uh, will not keep on crashing because of uh, viruses or malware. Therefore, buy a software with data security, a software also that is helping you to, to put passwords on your work to avoid hackers from getting close to your work. That is in uh, terms of uh, data security. Also, buy a software that is very easy to use. That is called user friendliness. Buy a software that is used, easier to use. Don't buy a software that will be keeping on calling the manufacturer or calling the seller, disturbing him or her. How do you do this? How do you do the other one? Buy a software with the help, a software with the debugging tools, a software that is attractive, a software that is user to use, simple to use, that is called user friendliness. Also, go for a software that is cheap. Compare, do window shopping. Different sellers will sell the same software at different exaggerated prices. Therefore, ask two to four sellers. Go around. On the other hand, buy a software that will work with your computer. Somebody may go and buy a software of the 32 bit, whereas his or her machine is 64 bit. Then try installing, get an error. Try installing, get an error. That one will give you a headache the whole day. Therefore, buy a software that is compatible, that will work. Buy a software that works, that suits the requirement of your machine. If it is 64 bit software, buy 64 bit. If it is 32 bit, don't buy 64 bit. Buy 32 bit. Therefore, your machine will be in a position to work accordingly. Rastre portability. Some people confuse how can a software be portable? A software can be portable. That means how can the software be copied to one to more than one computer? You can buy a software uh, that can only be copied in one machine, but you have eight machines. Therefore, you must go for a software that can be copied from one machine to the other depending on the license because some will be given for one user 
if you have f f a few machines, then go for multi user software, a software that can be shared, a software that can be uh, copied from one machine to, to the other. Therefore, uh, for the explanation on what we have learned, uh, we have the, the explanation here. But before probably we forget, there is this question that has been posted. A warranty. You are talking of a warranty. What what are the uh, properties? What are the properties of a good warranty? Therefore, when you talk about a good warranty, a warranty uh, that is the agreement between uh, the seller, that is the the seller and the buyer. Then you also need to know that uh, a warranty. That is, we said that uh, a warranty is an agreement between the buyer and the seller and spells out terms and conditions of after selling a product in case of failure or malfunction. Then what are the properties of a good warranty? Now a good warranty must have a scope of cover. For example, six months, one month, two years. Then it should also have something we call call out response and reliability agreement. For example, how long should the supplier take to repair a fault or replace the product? And if he or she delays, who bears the cost? That is called call out response as a good property of a good warranty. On the other hand, preventive maintenance. For example, regularly servicing the intervals. How shall we be processing the uh, how shall we be processing uh, that is repairing how regular will you be coming to service my gadgets and therefore those are the properties of a good warranty scope of cover call out response and preventive maintenance the rest there is explanation of what I have all uh, gone through that is um, multimedia capabilities cost portability warranty and microprocessor speed Therefore, that is the end uh, of our topic. That is a very long topic, computer systems. And therefore, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I will be doing more and more topics. And therefore, keep on checking on my channel. Subscribe if you have not subscribed. Share, comment, and also uh, like my videos. Therefore, I'm grateful. Thank you.